It's time to focus on seniors with Helping Seniors TV. The television show designed to make you aware of senior issues and needs, as well as to acquaint you with the resources available to help you age in place and with dignity. Now, here's your host, Joe Steckler. I'm Joe Steckler, and welcome to Helping Seniors, the television arm of Helping Seniors of Brevard County. Our show is designed to provide you with your own information on how to develop your own aging and care plans. Our topic today is in-home caregiving. And joining me is Jennifer Helen of Seniors Helping Seniors and Jackie Esterling of Levin Home Care. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. I think, I think viewing audience what based on my own personal experience and watching what has happened with having people elevated into unnecessary elements of care for the 25 years I've been working with seniors, I want you to pay particular attention and listen to how Jennifer and Jackie will help you understand there are many things that can happen to keep people in the home before it's necessary to even move them out of the home. And having established that, we'll then talk about how both of these ladies and their organization can still help people in assisted living and in nursing homes. So it's really a matter, I think Jennifer and Jackie, of our viewing audience and other people understanding what we really mean by elements of care. And in order to help do that, Jennifer, first I like, you have, probably with seniors helping senior, the most basic elements of care that can be brought to the caregiving situation. Is we do, that... we do. We're, we're the first step in, okay. in care. And what do you do? We do um, in-home care, um, it's considered homemaker companion, um, but what we do is help people go to the grocery store. Um, transportation to a doctor's appointment will help with housekeeping, meals, um, we'll change sheets, all of those uh, kind of everyday tasks that a senior might need a little bit of help with. Um, we don't do any medical. Um, we don't do any hands-on. So it's we are kind of that first step into care. When people start needing a little bit of care, that's where we come in. Okay. So if we, if we, if we look at a step ladder and we say the step ladder, the elements of care, you're on step, you're on We're rung the first one. rung, yes. You're rung one. Yes. You're rung one, but you're also... Higher up too. Correct. How do you differ Definitely. from what Jennifer does, Jackie? Well, what we're going to do, basically, we're going to do the hands-on part. We're going to go in because sometimes as things progress, um, you know, folks lose the ability to take their own shower uh, safely. They lose the ability to get dressed, to put on their TED hose, to do a variety of things that actually take someone touching, touching them, physical contact. Um, helping to prevent them from falling, um, making sure, not just making sure they're using their walker, but when they go to fall, being able to be there to catch them and touch them. Um, and, and again, that's the big component is that we're going to be able to do hands-on. We're going to be able to, to help facilitate the really physical needs of a person. Now, we're not, we're not into the nursing component where we're going to help with you know, IVs or anything medical in that capacity, but we're going to help them with those other basic needs that can keep them in their home longer. You know, there are a lot of people that do not understand one of the most difficult things for a person that has dementia to do is to take a shower. Mm. That is one of the most horrifying experiences a person with dementia experiences. Mm -hmm. They simply don't want to take a shower. And I could tell story after story of my own experience with things that have happened on people taking showers. but. In trying to assist people with showers, Jackie, do you mm -hmm. find that there is a reticence uh, more on the part of women or men to having somebody assist them with bathing? And I have a reason for asking you that. I tend to think um, the men are a little more difficult than what the women are, actually. Um, I'm not sure what the reason is for that, um, I, but it it. it at times, it's the men. Well, let me tell you why it might be. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. I had a stroke, and I went down in the uh, sea pines at my rehab. 
And uh, I had a couple of very nice looking nurses. <laughs> and one of those nurses was one of the ones that was going to give me a shower. And it had to be in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And she said, Mr. Steckler, she said, don't worry, I'm married. <laughs> I said, but you're not married to me. <laughs> so she started laughing, and, and I couldn't help but laugh myself. Mm -hmm. But it sort of broke the tension. And mm -hmm. Of course, in reality, you do your own personal washing yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's I think it's the element of understanding to get that person to realize brain length lies that that, that person is there to help you mm -hmm. and keep you safe. Right. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a task that they know how to perform to keep them safe. And I think, and that's the most important thing when you have somebody that's doing such personal care for you, that it is, this is a task, this is something being done for your well-being. Um, and, you know, when folks are refusing baths sometimes and showers, sometimes it's, you know, and you're talking about dementia, they really think they just took a shower. And so uh, that's, you, you, you know, the, the person has to know how to negotiate, you know, well, maybe you did take a shower yesterday or and you took a shower an hour ago, but you know what, this happened, so we need to do it again. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the difficult one. I just took one. <laughs> I know. know. Uh, we, we had that happen. In fact, when we built our first dementia center, we, we, we put a shower in there, a wheelchair type shower, so that if somebody needed a bath, we could wheel them in their wheelchair give them a shower, dry them off, and wheel them back out, let mm -hmm. them dry. But there are more ways that we can do things better. And I think that's, that's what your two types of home care bring. And I think it's important for the viewing audience to understand how the services that you two provide drive down the cost of care and why, how, I, I, you gave me an example one time of how you went in and you helped a lady for two hours in the morning, mm -hmm. and then later it became what she could. It became obvious to you that she needed more care. You did the same thing and putting her to bed. Mm -hmm. So you, in effect, got the lady up, put her to bed. And tell tell a little bit about that, and then based on what she's saying, figure out how the same situation applies to you. And you tell a similar story. But how, go with your story first, Jennifer. When we first started, we were just two hours in the morning. Um, we would go make sure she had her breakfast. Um, uh, give her a medication reminder, um, just kind of clean up the house. It was uh, a lot more social than anything, uh, but we made sure she ate and, and she had a good start to her morning. And then as her dementia progressed, um, she was no longer able to cook. She was not safe around her stove. Um, the, the stove was unplugged and we would come in and we would cook dinner at night for her using other <laughs> implements. Um, and we made sure that she had a good meal at night and that she was locked up tight um, and safe before we left yeah. uh, for the evening. But you did those types, as long as you knew that she was, she could sort of operate in her own home safely. Right. That's, that's a key right. word, safety. But that cost of care, what was that on a monthly basis? Less Roughly. than $1,000. Pardon? Less than $1,000. Yeah. An assisted living facility now is roughly 6000 5000 Depending on the facility. It could be anywhere mm -hmm. from maybe 2500 up to 6000 Yeah. And then yeah. the 6000 is going to go. Very to low end or $2,500. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Cadillacs are 6000 mm -hmm. So you have to decide what do you want. You want the Model T or the Model A? Mm -hmm. Now. And that, thinking what Jennifer said that she did, mm -hmm. what does Love and Home Care, what other tools do you bring to manage that person to keep her in a home? You can mm -hmm. do the same thing that Jennifer did. We can do, yeah, we can do the same thing. And we're going to add to it that, you know, we're going to help get them dressed in the morning because sometimes, again, as the dementia increases, it's not just as simple as saying, you know, put your clothing on, put your shirt on, put whatever your shoes on. It actually is a task of, you know, buttoning the shirts and, and helping them put one leg in the pants or, you know, the other leg in the pants and getting things going. So, and the, and the nice part, you know, is that that person that's their friend, um, the companion is not 
sometimes it gets to be, you know, a little bit of a threatening thing when people are touching. So it's good to keep that companion relationship. And then when you're switching over, now things of, you know, we can partner, we'll come in and do the hands-on. We'll come in there and we'll do the, put the clothing on. We'll... Right. But both of you are helping that client mm -hmm. understand what it is that they truly need. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's a, and, and then how, what are some of the tricks uh, that you all can do to help, help, people as they age and as they develop the forms of different types of dementia, how can you help them understand what it is they need? How do you do that? Is there any kind of a secret? Well, I think everybody is different and your mm -hmm. approach has to be tailored to that, that mm -hmm. particular person's needs um, and that family's needs uh, and their mm -hmm. schedules. Um, there are times when we have gone in the family said, please, if my mom knows that we are paying for this, she'll refuse it. Mm -hmm. Please come in as my friend. Mm -hmm. And and we hate to fib to the person with dementia, but it's a way to be able to get the help in that she needs so that she can stay in her home. Um, mm -hmm. We've got one lady who I'm not sure how this happened, but she thinks we're the welcome wagon. And the daughter said, just go with it. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, she, she loves you guys coming in. We play dominoes with her. We make sure she has dinner. She she really enjoys it, so we just mm -hmm. and we just some, go with it. <laughs> and sometimes you get situations where things are gone wonderfully for a period of time, and all of a sudden something clicks. So the organization needs to understand, and the families need to understand. I, I know our organizations, hers and mine. If things are changing and personalities are changing, then we change our caregiver, and we try to accommodate those changes. Um, even working you know, for as long as I have in this industry, you can have people that are together in situations for years. And then all of a sudden with a change in their dementia, whatever, they don't like that person anymore. And there's no, there's nothing you're going to do to change it. They don't like that person anymore. So the organization, our organizations, I know we, you know, we work really hard to accommodate those changes. What you're saying, and I think is an element we never really talk about is that effective caregiving from both angles enables uh, that person to stay in a home longer and mm -hmm. then if if the caregiver if the if the organization providing the caregiving is very attentive they can change persons to to accommodate a changing personality mm -hmm. absolutely and mm -hmm. that that enable see that's one of the ways that I keep saying that we can use these types of care to drive down the overall cost of care. Mm -hmm. Many people probably watching this show today will say, "What in the world are the types of costs that you're talking about?" Uh, in your case, I mean, you're roughly what? What are your what are your basic charges, Jennifer? It's it's, it's a fair question. Um. Pretty much any of the in-home care is $16 an hour, and we have a two-hour minimum. We'll do as much as a 24-7, uh, but we've got a two-hour minimum, so we try to be very flexible so we can meet the family's needs. That's what we needed when when uh, uh, our grandmother needed help. We needed somebody in the morning just to make sure she had a good breakfast, make sure she got a, her day off to a good start. Then we were there every afternoon. but. Um, at that time, there wasn't anyone doing that. So when we started, it was really important for us to stay flexible so that we could meet people's needs. Yeah. Well, think about this just a second. I don't know. I don't know if you all are still in the market for babysitters or anything like that, but I understand babysitters right now run $10, $12 an hour for a night. And let's say if a couple goes out and they got a babysitter comes in for four hours, you're talking forty dollars to watch a baby. Yeah. Here we are. We've got for thirty two dollars, you go in and help a senior person get them cleaned up, get them dressed, mm -hmm. get them fed, get them situated for the day, pick up the house a little bit, mm -hmm. and we're talking if you're spending. 32 in the morning, 32 at night, $64 a day, five mm -hmm. days a week, 300, uh, 300 times four, $1,200. Mm -hmm. They're in their own home safely. The family can watch them a little bit on the weekend, help on the weekend. 
So you're you're doing the care there for twelve hundred dollars as opposed mm -hmm. to. Four thousand, say, in a, in a decent assisted living facility, mm -hmm. and a person mm -hmm. is happy they're where they want to be. Mm -hmm. And it's important for the families to take a break. I mean, it's wonderful when the folks can stay home and be with family, but families always need to understand that it's real important for them to take a break too and get out. And um, again, just the same as the babysitter situation when you have kids. I mean, parents always need to take a break. And, and it's the well, let's same talk when about that. We're, we're, I, we've been homing in on what it costs to. Uh, uh, to take care of the parent. How about the cost uh, or the relief, the respite that the primary caregiver gets by you all with your two levels of care? Mm -hmm. What can you help our viewing audience understand about what it is you do to help them take some of that stress off the caregiving situation? And that is so important. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that along the same line that Jackie was, a lot of times we see where the primary caregiver ends up sick mm -hmm. because they're always taking care of their loved one. They don't go to their own doctor's appointments. They mm -hmm. stop taking care of themselves and they're the ones that end up sick. So it's really important that they take that break, go mm -hmm. to their doctor's appointments, um, have a little bit of time out so that they can be in a continue to be an effective caregiver. Mm -hmm. And we can take a lot of that stress from them. Yeah. And the other really important part of that is when something happens to that caregiver, if they haven't been taking care of their, themselves and there's, all, there's this crisis that happens, then you have this person that always had a caregiver. They're kind of in the lurch of whoever can step in to, to handle things. And sometimes people make not so good drastic decisions in that crisis situation. So, you know, if the son's taking care of mom, the son gets sick and goes to the hospital, and there's really no backup plan, you get all kinds of people stepping in, and there's no backup plan. Whereas if you're taking the breaks and you're bringing people in to be introduced to um, someone into the home, you've got a backup plan. You know, you have somebody you can call to say, you know, this is what happened. I can come in to help. And those are much better situations than the ones where, you know, the son goes to the hospital and then the, you know, the police are there and they decide they're going to help and they think they're doing the right thing. And it, you know, just things get messed up. They get all tangled. And um, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, the safety aspects that seniors, helping seniors and 11 home care how about some of the safety aspects you bring to protecting the patient mm -hmm. and at the same time protecting the families? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you observe or how important are the powers of observation from both of your organizations in helping the, under the family understand when it's time for that person to go to a different element of care? Mm -hmm. how, how do you all do that? The different different element of care, and also there's there's many other things that we're watching for as we're there mm -hmm. in the home with the with the person, and it I think it's magnified because we have so many families that are so spread apart. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad retired to Florida, but the kids are in California, Texas, New York, mm -hmm. Connecticut. They're not here, so they don't have eyes on the ground. So if there is a crisis situation, they need a local person here to be able to step in. Mm -hmm. You know, and hopefully it's someone who's already got a relationship with that person, so it's not a big deal. Oh, I know them. Mm -hmm. That's my caregiver. They're just here a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Um we're also looking for fraud. We're looking mm -hmm. for, the, our seniors are so at risk mm -hmm. of the telephone calls. I mean, we, we've talked about it before. We get them at home ourselves. Mm -hmm. So a senior <laughs> picking up the phone, um, people coming to knock on the door, hey, your roof looks like it needs mm -hmm. to be replaced. I can do that for you. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the roof down the street. Um, there are so many ways that a person could be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So we're always keeping that in the background as well. Um, do you all do the same type of thing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's just, it's scary, um, the situations you run into. In fact, um, we just came into one where the gentleman had been taken advantage of by, a, a, I'll be nice and say a young lady who came into the home and brought her business with her into the home, which was not a very good business. Um, she was arrested outside of the home where she was taking advantage of this gentleman, she, but she was arrested outside for um, some things she had done that they caught her for. But when it came back to all the horrible things she had done to this person, this elderly gentleman, um, nothing was ever done to press charges against 
her for those things. And he had now has, you know, out of money, um, car gone, the whole bit. But coming into it, I, I, you know, found these things out and I was like, well, he does have access to a victim's fund. Well, finding out that he never reported, the, the crime was never reported that happened to him, he doesn't, he's not eligible for help to get him back on his feet and get the right appropriate care. So now they, they are making a report to the police department, but had it not been another set of eyes, there. Um, it they, it, nothing would have happened and she would have gotten away. And again, probably spent very little time in jail going back and done it to somebody else. And those are the things that frustrate me the most. <laughs> I, I think that uh, one of one of our uh, people we work with was pointing out, and I'm not sure if it was one of you or not, but so many people go to the vestibule of their church mm -hmm. and they take a look at all the names there that uh, mm -hmm. people say they they want to come in and help. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there's, just because a person has placed a name in a church vestibule saying they're going to help somebody, um, we need more of a vetting process than that. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. that's why I feel very strongly about going through agencies, because you have to provide checks and you have insurance. I, I think, unless the law has changed, if you send somebody into a home to take care of somebody, your company is ultimate responsible. Am I correct? They ours carry their own insurance, but they are insured. They're licensed, bonded, and insured. Right, but all your people that you go in are bonded. Yes, and they mm -hmm. and they're they've got a federal background check. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's state licensing. That's we we're required to do that. So they've been checked through all fifty states. Mm -hmm. So you know at least that they're they're an honest person. Right. Um, you know, that doesn't mean it's the end all be all with an agency, but it's, it's mm -hmm. at least another level of protection that you have, um, so that, mm -hmm. you know, you're not letting someone in. We had a gentleman, uh, down in the Barefoot Bay area. He, just, he, oh, this, this, my guy that helps me, he's just wonderful. Well, all of a sudden he had a really large contractor's blower, one of those backpack blowers that you would, you know, blow your lawn off with, but it's, it was a huge, very professional looking one. This gentleman walks with a cane. He's not well. Not something that he would really be capable of using. Why do you have the, oh, well, my, my helper needed that. Your what? My helper needed that. We really started looking into it. We just looked at the Brevard County website, pulled up this gentleman's um, history and showed it to our client and said, this is, this is your helper. He had been he had been taking money. He had been really taking advantage of this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he saw the the rap sheet basically on this gentleman, he realized that he was not out to help him. Mm -hmm. Well, I think th the moral of the story is that we need to be very careful about who we invite into our homes. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about seniors helping seniors, I know how you all started. I don't know as much about the background for 11 home care, but I know you, mm -hmm. and I know how vocal you are about situations that are not right. <laughs> and that's why I feel very comfortable about having these two ladies on the show, folks, because what they're saying to you and what you should be taking from this show today is that you need to pay particular attention, especially if you're a long range caregiver. Mm -hmm. You need to pay mm -hmm. attention to what your detached family mm -hmm. is receiving, what you're doing, and who is taking care of them. Because uh, it doesn't take much to get somebody else's name on a checkbook. Once somebody else's name is on a checkbook, they can they can move everything in your account out of there. Mm -hmm. All it takes is a, is a name on the account. And uh, it's sad to say, but uh, I'm sure... Both of you have encountered that, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Unfortunately. And trying to rectify it is most likely not going to happen mm -hmm. because the law simply doesn't work retroactively. Actually, there's been some changes in the law, and I think they took effect in October of last year because Laura Moody, who's with the State Attorney General's Office here, 
Um, she saw that as a problem that, you know, people were coming in, putting their names on the checkbook, wiping people out. And she really was an advocate to getting some changes to the law that now makes it possible if it's reported. And again, I, what frustrates me is these things don't get reported. But now when people report these types of crimes, they can go back and they can look at what that money is being spent on. So if that person to put their name on the checkbook has started taking money out to buy a new car for themselves or a trip to Paris or whatever, then they can be prosecuted. So you there have to, been... We need to talk about more of this. Out absolutely. Because right? because that's something that's extremely... Good. Maybe you will write an article for us for our Senior Scene magazine for our newsletter, okay? <laughs> okay. Very good. All right, as a deal And there. encourage people to report it. <laughs> encourage a lot of people, people don't. Well, no, they don't. It's extremely important. If the people that are being victimized, mm -hmm. if they don't bring it to the attention of people that mm -hmm. can do something about it, we don't correct any of these situations. No. And they go to the next house and they yeah. do it again. Jennifer, I'm going to give you the last word. Now, you talk a lot. <laughs> no. What, what was, what's the last piece of advice you'd like our viewing audience to take away today? Especially with what we've talked about here today, um, I would like people to really remember to have a plan. Um, it's okay to have help in the house. A lot of people are uh, resistant, but it is okay to have help in the house. Have that plan, um, especially if you know your kids are all across the country. Um, you know, have an emergency plan in place. Plan ahead. Um, be okay with somebody coming in. Get a relationship started okay. so that if you do have a problem, you're you're not point. making quick mm -hmm. decisions. Okay. I want to thank you both for watching for being here with me today. And I want to thank you, viewer, for watching today's episode of Helping Seniors.